imagine a place where murderers are hailed as heroes? Can you imagine a custom that rewards families for killing their own daughters, where fathers and brothers stalk the women they say they love? Right now, thousands of women are living in fear, and if they survive, they're forced to spend their entire lives in hiding. Diane, you've been a lot of places and covered some shocking situations, I know, but I know this got to you, this really strange world of honored death. It did, because it seems to me that it has a kind of unique cruelty. The whole thing originates with the fact that men in certain traditional cultures feel that everything a woman in their family does reflects on them, their stature, their manhood. Now, by the way, this is not about any one religion. It's not about Islam. Nor is it about the Middle East. Honor killings occur in Pakistan and India as well. And what about the country of Jordan, where we go? Well, it's a very modern country, but in some areas, there is still an ancient code designed to keep women from living independent lives. We are going to begin now with a terrified woman, a fugitive, who is hiding out right here in this country. We'll call her Samira. We cannot show you her face because this Jordanian woman has been marked for execution by the people she loves. I was followed by my father and his relatives, and they were after me to kill me. She escaped to America. She speaks perfect English, though we've had to disguise her voice. And what did she do to provoke this? She fell in love with a man her family disapproved of, got pregnant and married him, and became a hunted woman. I have locks on the doors that I check every night and every day. And I do go through periods of time where every single sound that goes on in the house makes me nervous. She says the male members of her family are trying to kill her to restore family honor. And she told us back in Jordan for months she had to look over her shoulder worried that someone was in the shadows around the corner. She and her husband hid fleeing from home to home. We had to do everything we could to mislead and lose anyone who was following us. I basically had to disguise myself by wearing the traditional Muslim dress and head cover. And the threat to Samira's life was real. In Jordan alone, a quarter of all the homicides are honor killings, an average of 25 women at least every year. People need to know the truth. People need to know that there are, there are things like this happening, that women are killed for no reason. Rana Husseini is a trailblazing journalist for the Jordan Times whose fearless reporting on this secret, taboo subject has made headlines around the world. She says in some of her country's traditional communities, the men feel that a woman's purity is the most important part of a family's reputation. The family is shamed if there's even a rumor that a daughter is not a virgin, or if she refuses an arranged marriage, or has an extramarital affair, or is disobedient. One girl was murdered because she smoked a cigarette in public. In many families, they believe that once she tarnishes the image, it's just, just like breaking glass. It can't be, be fixed. And the only way to fix it is to kill her. Today in Jordan, if a woman is being stalked by family, her only hope may be prison, where government officials often send women in danger. This is Dwida Prison in Amman, the capital of Jordan. So we don't know what we're going to find here. All we know is that we've been told that at least 30 women have come here because they were pregnant out of wedlock, because there were rumors that they were virgins, and they're fugitives. And the situation is dire enough that they're here, not as prisoners, but to be protected. Slowly, from among the women who surround us in the courtyard, a frightened young girl comes forward to tell her story. This is a teenager we'll call Mona. She has been here for over nine months. Your father pulled a gun out and shot you. Mona comes from a rural area of Jordan where her father forced her into an arranged marriage with a man 30 years her senior. She was miserable and one night slipped away with a man she really loved. When her father found out, he brought her to this park, handed her pills, poison, saying he didn't want to go to jail. So she knew what she must do. She gave me a bottle of pills. She told me, you do whatever you have to do to kill yourself, burn yourself, or even poison yourself. I just don't want to see you on the face of the earth. Did you think about taking them? 
No. Instead, she says she fled to the police who brought her to prison. Then three months later, her father told her that all was forgiven and that he would never hurt her. He told me not to be afraid. No harm will happen to you. A few visits later, as Mona dreamed of going home, her father walked through the door, saw her, pulled out a gun, and fired four times, twice in the abdomen, once in her leg and hand. Did he say anything to you before he shot? He said, how are you, my daughter? How is your health? And that's it. How is your health? Today, this is Mona's home, a prison bed. There is no place to go. Where should I go? I'm afraid. Here it's better. It's safer. So this will be your whole life? I don't know. Another girl came forward. We'll call her Fatma. She's a Christian and says her father turned on her, horrified that she became pregnant, and even worse to him, by a Muslim man. I don't know how you live with the idea that your own family might try to hurt you. And do you know that in the rest of the world, this looks impossible? These are our traditions from long ago. Do you love your father? Yes. Yes. Still? How is that possible? I've made a mistake. I know I'm wrong. So you think it's your fault? <laughs> yes. Most of them who I talked to, I said, do you prefer to be outside or inside? So they said, doesn't matter because I'm already dead. A warning. We are going to show you some forensic photographs that are not easy to look at. The fate Mona and Fatma and Samira are desperate to avoid. Girls and women shot, strangled, stabbed. Hideous murders all committed by fathers, brothers, or uncles who suspected that the women were sexually impure. But in fact, autopsies showed that more than half of the women turned out to have been virgins after all. That was it. When I knew that she made a mistake, there was no other solution but that she should die. This is 27-year-old Sarhan Abdullah. He sells fruit juice on the streets of Amman. He says last year he learned his youngest sister, 20-year-old Yasmin, was no longer a virgin. And so it's right to kill her? Yes, of course. Sarhan says her loss of virginity was an unbearable shame, even though, according to court documents, Yasmin lost her virginity because she was sexually assaulted. But if she's raped, it's not her fault. What do you mean, it's not her mistake? Certainly, it's her mistake. But she had no choice. What led her to this situation? For me, an honorable girl, while she's on the street, I cannot rape her unless she comes along with me in my car or to my house. Sarhan says his duty was to his family once his sister lost her virginity. That if he didn't act, they would be outcasts in their community. The women might have trouble finding husbands, and the men would be ridiculed. I might have an argument with a friend of mine or a relative. The first thing he would say to me is, if you had honor, you would not be a pimp for her. Letting her live means I am a pimp. Jasmine knew her life was in danger, and for protection, went to the police. Had she found a safe haven, or would the men in her family follow her to the end and exact their revenge? There's much more of Diane's story. Stay with us. In a moment, a family sets a trap for a trusting daughter. Did you at any point say, I can't do this? This is, this is my sister. I can't do this. 2020 Friday continues. Now, Barbara Walters. We continue now with Diane's rare journey into a terrifying world where women live in fear that their own relatives want them dead. As you said earlier, it's unfathomable. We are going to go again to Jordan. And by the way, later in the report, we will speak with Her Majesty, the Queen of Jordan, Queen Noor. But first, back to the young woman we told you about a few moments ago. The young woman who finds herself in the aftermath of a sexual assault alone, afraid, and desperate for help. March 1st of last year, a 
frightened 20-year-old Yasmin Abdullah went to this police precinct in Amman, Jordan, seeking protection, suspecting correctly that her father and brother had turned against her. How did it happen? One night you sat with your father and the two of you decided she had to die? Yes, of course. Sarhan says they made a plan, send word to Yasmin that she was safe. He even had his father sign a guarantee that he wouldn't hurt her. I was the one who told him to do it so that she would come out and I would kill her. Yasmin trusted the guarantee and went home. She had spent two days with the family when her brother Sarhan returned from a trip. Immediately, the two went into the living room to talk about what had happened in the last few days. Without uttering a word, Sarhan pulled a gun and shot his sister four times in the head and chest. Yasmin died on the spot. Did you at any point say, I can't do this. This is, this is my sister. I can't do this. I this is her life. No, no, no. You're proud of it? Yes, of course. Is your family pleased? Yes, of course. Your mother? Yes. Your father? Yes. Your other sister? Yes. Afterwards, he walked to the police station and turned himself in. Which raises the question, what protection does the law provide? Well, Jordanian courts specifically grant leniency in these cases to the killer. On average, in Jordan, the man spends only three months to a year in jail. Which is exactly what happened to Sarhan. He was sentenced to one year, but after just six months, the judge set him free. Here at his cousin's bachelor party, he's a celebrated member of the family. In releasing him, the judge said Sarhan's, quote, great anger when he learned that his sister was no longer a virgin was justification for a short sentence. The problem is that the society deal with such a person as a hero, as a person who was strong enough, a, a man enough to, uh, to clean, to wash uh, with blood the honor of the, uh, of the family. Asa Hadir is one of the chief women's rights advocates in Jordan. She's outraged by Sarhan's light sentence and horrified by the message the law sends to Jordanian society. Uh, it's, it's too difficult. The message is that uh, there is nothing wrong in what she did. This will encourage other young men, other men to kill. It looks crazy to the rest of the world. But what if you go back into your community and say, let's stop this now. I don't want it to happen to my daughters. Let's Stop it. If I would tell my family not to kill her, my father, for example, how could he sit among the men and talk with them? How will he be able to face the people? Could we see a photo of her? Do you have a photograph? I don't think so. They burned them all. It's as if she never existed. Yes. And what about this baby girl, Sarhan's niece? Someday, will the men in her family turn against her? Would you do the same thing again to another sister, to a daughter? Yes, because for us, there is no other solution. And that's what these people thought too, here, in this Arab community in Israel. In this 1995 home video, a crowd is gathered in the street to celebrate because one of the town's daughters has just been slaughtered. Dalir El Carmel is a Druze community. The Druze are Arabs who broke away from Islam a thousand years ago. Here, it's considered unforgivable to marry someone not Druze because they're a small minority worried that their culture will disappear. So when 39-year-old Iftahaj Hassoun lived with a man outside the community, the village so disapproved of her, her brother Amr was taunted for years and not even allowed to marry. Finally, he snapped. One day, prosecutors say, he lured Iptahaj home with a lie, saying her father was paralyzed. They were in the car together when Amr says an argument broke out. He pulled out a knife and attacked Iptahaj, stabbing her ten times, including in the heart and lungs. The village heard about it and came. That scene you saw with the crowd gathered around was right here. And in the center, Iptahaj, dead on the ground. The crowd cheered at her death, elated to be rid of the woman who had shamed them, celebrating when the ambulance took her away.
Amr, now in Shata prison, was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to 20 years to life by an Israeli court. But his attorney, Zaki Hamal, is appealing the conviction, arguing that the three years Amr has spent in prison are enough. He is isolated from his family, from his community, from everything in life, just because he was involved in the death of his sister. I don't think that he is in his character killer or murderer. Of course he is a murderer. Somebody who murders somebody else is a murderer. There is no excuses for murder. There is no justification. Aida Tuma Suleiman is an Arab-Israeli activist against honor killing. To see uh, the village going out happily for what happened, that uh, was uh, very ugly, that was very frightening. We found Iftahaj's family and persuaded them to talk. The mother was grieving, but not for her daughter. Do you still love Iftahaj? To tell you that I love her, I don't, because she made my blood boil, really boil. You're very tough. Yes, I know I'm tough. In the living room, not one remembrance of Iftahaj anywhere, while Amr's photograph dominates the room. Every day, the family lovingly awaits his call from prison. But what if he is eventually free to come home? Will his sisters, Jacqueline and Johanna, live in fear? If someday you make a mistake, are you going to be afraid of Amr? No. But why not? If you make a mistake, what's to stop your brothers from killing you? She's the one who made the mistake. She's different than we are. A murder happened in this family, so they are threatened. Even if they think differently, they will not speak about it. I get the sense that you don't agree with what your brother did. I get the sense that you don't feel as your mother and brother do. Yes. Yes, you're right about that. But also what they said was right. We also went in search of the village leader, Akram Hassoun. He says he opposes honor killing. Yet he too is working non-stop to bring Amr home and says no one in the village wept for Iftahad. Would what happened to her have happened to a man? Uh, no. We believe that uh, the women, uh, they are uh, the honor, the, uh, the respect of the society here. When you say the word respect, yes, kind of sends a shiver through women in America. With this kind of respect, who needs enemies? You know, nobody will understand uh, the situation in your society in America. You will not understand this well. But what about an American-born woman who lives in Jordan? Her Majesty, Queen Noor. She says for years she wasn't aware of honor killing because the practice was so hidden. But now, she adds, momentum is building for change. The big question is, what's taking so long? They assume that you could go in, or His Majesty could go in tomorrow, issue a decree, and to say, it's over. Don't do this anymore. Won't tolerate this anymore. And it can happen. Why not? It isn't ever really possible to, to change an ancient cultural tradition by decree. But for those who have lost their lives, there's no... We, we, we all um, should have acted sooner. The Queen is pushing for a new law to eliminate the kind of lenient sentencing which allowed Sarhan to get out of jail. She's also supporting the creation of shelters so that women like Mona will have some place to go. Is this of personal importance to you? Oh, yes, of course it is. It, it, it's important to me as a Jordanian, it's important to me as a Muslim, and it's important to me as a woman, of course. Um, and a mother. And, of course, as a mother. Again, Rana Husseini, the Jordanian journalist who brought the story out into the open. I think this is very important for people to see that the leaders are talking about it. And this is how we start. You know, something has to change. We're approaching the 21st century, and we are still living in the 19th century. Which brings us back to Samira, who is hiding in America, the woman you saw at the top of this report. She says someday, if her family does find her and carries out its death sentence, 
at least in America, the law might make them pay. And even if it comes to the point where I am killed, at least I will die knowing that they will be prosecuted, that they will get their just punishment, and they will not get away with it as they would have in Jordan. You should know that Jordan's Queen Noor is trying to establish a shelter for these women. And now that King Hussein is back home after cancer treatment in the United States, there is hope that he will speak out even more forcefully. Diane, if these women can leave the country, do they find asylum in other countries? For example, do they here? Uh, the United States still has a very ambiguous record on taking them in, but Canada tends to take them in and be friendlier. <laughs> what happens to the ones who are still hiding in prison? Occasionally they can broker marriages with widowed men, older men who don't care if their wives are virgins. Otherwise, the rest of their lives in prison. Mm -hmm. It is horrific. Thank you.